for this project, I have decided to examine managers as leaders and provide some examples of poor and quality leadership so that managers can better understand how to be good leaders. Our first example of poor leadership comes from the Sultan of Agrabah, the hapless Sultan from the movie Aladdin. The Sultan is a good example of a leader who needs approval in order to function. Throughout the movie, the Sultan consistently avoids conflict, avoids correcting others out of fear of hurting their feelings, in this particular case his daughter, and he places less weight on his own personal feelings out of a fear of rejection. Here we can see that symptom in particular, as the Sultan is unable to voice his own reservations and concerns about his daughter's future as well as the methods by which that future will be secured. Jafar, a deceitful advisor, wishes to use the diamond ring seen here, which is a priceless family heirloom, as a magical reagent. The Sultan can only stammer his concerns before inevitably conceding. Convinced of his own inadequacy in such matters, which is another symptom of a leader that craves approval too much, he gives in, causing the whole conflict of the film to erupt. Our next example of a bad leader comes from the movie Dr. Strangelove, specifically the character of Brigadier General Jack D. Ripper. Jack's decision to launch his flight of atomic bombers into Russian airspace starts the conflict of the film, specifically because he has done this without orders. General Ripper believes he has the answer to, and the responsibility for, everyone's problems. He is uncomfortable merely waiting for instructions from his superiors, as clearly seen in this quote, and refuses to delegate work to others. In this movie, General Ripper plays off a flustered Captain Mandrake, who is flustered precisely because Ripper refuses to relinquish control to the more even-keeled subordinate, and courts atomic disaster because of this. Ripper gets quite defensive about attempts to let someone else handle this, even though it becomes increasingly obvious that the unhinged general should not be in command, especially when another symptom of being a control freak manifests itself. Most control freaks can be oblivious to social cues, and as demonstrated by this rather vivid violation of Mandrake's personal space, General Ripper certainly fits the bill. Unable to take the hint that his long, paranoid diatribes about preserving his precious bodily fluids mere hours away from thermonuclear Armageddon, are taking the nerve out of his subordinate, he assumes the negative reaction is merely a sign of Mandrake's weakness and stupidity. As such, General Ripper explains his conspiracy theories over and over to Mandrake, usually in awkward positions like this, assured that Mandrake's resistance and confusion shows that it was right for him to keep his subordinates out of the loop. Now that we've seen two examples of poor leadership, Let's take a look at some elements that can be used to make a good leader. Enter Paul Atreides from the movie and book Dune. Paul is the perfect example of a charismatic leader. He has a high degree of self-confidence, born from his noble upbringing and his special education in the ways of the Bene Gesserit, a monastic order that emphasizes mind over matter. He has a high level of energy and enthusiasm that helps him survive the most difficult of conditions, and a clear vision for the future that he communicates effectively to his followers, the Fremen. This particular image, however, shows what I personally believe is the most important aspect of a charismatic leader, and that is an active focus on image building and role modeling. Paul is considered to be an outsider to the Fremen at the beginning of the film, while he is strong and respected, he still has this outsider label. In this scene, Paul rectifies that situation by taking control of one of Dune's gigantic sandworms. This particular event has religious significance to the Fremen, and Paul understands that this will give him the image of a savior to their people and an insider in their community. While this sort of display can be construed as manipulative, that is simply part of being charismatic. Another element leaders can use to their advantage are trust mechanisms. Simply put, these are ways of getting subordinates and peers to trust you. These start with small gestures and recognition of another person's expertise, while on a deeper level, trust building requires strong signaling of one's own intentions and abilities and a recognition of other people's dilemmas in trusting you. All around, the film Aliens is good for demonstrating a lot of these topics.
untrustworthy individuals use official clout in order to get other people to bend to their will. Members of the group repeatedly have difficulty putting faith in others' abilities, and all of this occurs in a pressure cooker, with aliens constantly closing in around the group. This scene in particular shows this trust dynamic. The de facto leader of the group, Ellen Ripley, does not trust the character on the left. This is not without good reason. The character on the left is named Bishop, and he's an android. On a previous mission, Ellen Ripley's group all died because of an android specifically one that deceived the group into thinking that he was their ally. Understanding this, throughout the film, Bishop makes an effort to demonstrate that he is trustworthy, constantly being transparent and informing the rest of the group about why he's doing what he's doing. In the climax of this particular arc, Bishop decides that he will go out and risk his life on a dangerous mission to go start up a communications array so they can call for help. While at the beginning of the film, Ripley probably would not have trusted Bishop, now she recognizes that he is a trustworthy individual, thanks to his strong signaling and his understanding of how to earn someone's trust. Now at a critical juncture where his expertise is needed, Bishop is able to take on this vital mission without any opposition from the rest of the group. Next up is the coercive style of leadership, demonstrated most colorfully by Darth Vader. Darth Vader really does make a perfect example of this style. He demands immediate and unflinching compliance from his subordinates, which builds up resentment in their ranks. Moments before this screenshot, that animosity was very clearly captured as Vader is beset by insults like sorcerer and wizard, and while his brutality can be good at snapping his subordinates into shape, in the long term it proves to be to his detriment. Taking a coercive style to leadership often leads to a high rate of turnover, which in Vader's taste takes on a amusingly lethal overtone. Needless to say, this style of leadership should be used sparingly. Demonstrating far more apt leadership is Henry V. Henry uses an authoritative style of leadership. Instead of demanding unflinching compliance, an authoritative leader orients their members towards a cohesive and clear goal. An authoritative leader also rewards and welcomes initiative among their subordinates. Together, the leader and their subordinates strive towards a clearly defined goal, which oftentimes is contextualized within a larger sense of change within the organization. In Henry V's case, that change comes in the form of a regime change between his father, Henry IV, and him, Henry V. The key to the authoritative style is to treat one's subordinates with respect and point them towards a clear goal that is communicated effectively. That respect and that setting of a goal are encapsulated perfectly in the speech depicted above. This is, of course, the famous St. Crispin's Day speech, in which the king calls his subordinates his brothers and to fight in the upcoming battle with intense bravery, so that they all may go home the envy of those who did not come to battle. Next we have the democratic leader. The democratic leader lets employees sort themselves out with only light guidance and takes input from all different sources. The direction of the organization as a whole is determined by a consensus among those subordinates. Captain Picard, seen here at the end of the table, is a quintessential example of a democratic leader. One of the most famous sets from Star Trek The Next Generation is the meeting room, and that is due in large part to Captain Picard's leadership style. The senior staff often takes long meetings to decide on a course of action. This is particularly helpful because in Star Trek, the path to success is often not clear. In those ambiguous situations, the democratic style works best, which is certainly why Captain Picard relies on this style so much. Other elements of this style can also be seen in Captain Picard's actions. In this particular scene, Captain Picard rarely speaks. Instead, he lets his subordinates bounce ideas off of each other and merely observes. When he is finally called upon to make a decision, he can do so with confidence, knowing that that idea has been thoroughly vetted by his subordinates. Finally, we have the pace setting style. A leader that uses the pace setting style oftentimes gets down in the trenches and works alongside their subordinates. This can take the form of the leader showing the subordinate how they want the job done, or in a less formal and structured follow-me approach to leadership. In contrast to Captain Picard, 
we here have Captain Kirk. While Captain Picard tends to stay on the Enterprise and lead from the bridge, Captain Kirk likes to beam down to the planet. In the scene above, Kirk has beamed over to a derelict ship alongside several of his subordinates. While this pace setting style can often have a negative impact on morale, Kirk knows when and where to use it, namely among a small driven team of experts. This scene demonstrates that perfectly. This ancient and malfunctioning ship has aboard it several cryogenically frozen individuals. So Kirk beams over with an engineer, a doctor, and a historian. Instead of demanding they follow him, he acts more as a liaison between the three of them, organizing their expertise and directing it in a productive way, while always being ready to make an executive decision when the situation warrants it.